Okay, so let's start. So today is about sequential analysis. We already started this week talking about sequential analysis during the lecture time. So again, one more time, let's go through it and see if you have any question. So firstly, what is sequential analysis? So we started earlier last week talking about association analysis, where we were interested in the transactions made. And then from these transactions, we were able to extract association rules, right? Finding interesting relationship between items inside the transaction or market basket data set. Now in sequential analysis, we firstly, you need to care about the time because the word sequential is there. So that means you need to know the sequence of actions that you have, maybe transactions, right? Or maybe uh, calculating reading values from, from your sensors, temperature, humidity, and so on and so forth. So the time is important. When you have a data set, you need to check to see that the time is there. Otherwise, if you don't know the sequence of how the data were collected at what time, then you may have a problem. You cannot apply sequential analysis. So earlier we were looking for item sets or transactions, and then we were interested to find relationship between the items. But this is for market basket analysis. Now, when we go to the sequence, again, we have that we need to have the transaction ID, but in this case, the transaction ID is also giving us information about the sequence of the transaction, meaning which transaction has been made first. It's not a random value. If you just you are assigning random values for your transactions without capturing the time, then can be a problem. But for this example, the transaction ID by itself, we can know the sequence of the transaction. And then if we are capturing the customer ID, like this case here, so we may be interested to look what, what future products or purchases the customer may do. Okay, so in this case, you may be interested to send advertisement to the customer asking him or maybe giving him a promotion to encourage to increase your sales. Right, so again, if you know that the customer one has made purchases A, B, and D, then followed by B, C, and D, followed by B, C, and D, then you may be interested to know what's going to be next. Right, so this is about sequential analysis. Now, as I said, we were looking during the practical session into a special case of sequential analysis, which is time series. So time series refer to a sequence of data points collected over a regular period of time and equally spaced over the time when we talk about time series. That means if you are capturing, let's say, the oil price changes, then on daily basis, that means you need to ensure that every day you capture the price for the oil. Cannot say, okay, for some time I take every day, other time I take every two days, other times I take every three days, All right? So they should be equally spaced readings. Same like if you are collecting humidity or temperature values, then maybe you set every, every day at 8 a.m. I'm gonna collect readings, for example. So you have equally spaced data points collected over the time. <clears throat> and we looked into time series, univariate, and multivariate analysis. So we have univariate means we are looking for single variable, single data point collected at the time. For example, we're looking for temperature. So if we collect only one data point, which is temperature over the time, and we draw a figure, this figure will give us unit variate figure, right? Because we have only one value captured over the time, like the case here or can be multivariate if you are capturing multiple data points over the time. So maybe you are interested to capture the humidity and then also capture the temperature and so on and so forth. So you have more than one reading over the time. So this one can yield multivariate figure or multivariate time series. Now, multivariate time series can be useful to find if there's a relationship between the readings or the variables that you are collecting data for. As in this figure shows us, the number of visitors per month and the temperature has been captured and then also drawn on this figure. So we can see that there's a tandem, right? There's a harmony or tandem between the number of visitors per month 
as well as the temperature value. When the temperature goes up, right, when the temperature goes up, also the number of visitors goes, uh, goes up as well. So that indicates there's a relationship and that is logical. So as we said, this indicate during summertime, people tend to go out for vacation more than during winter time. Time series can also be applied to do data imputation. So if you have a figure like this and you have missing values, you might be interested to find those missing values by applying time series. Can also be used to spot anomalies. Anomalies means anomalies mean outliers. Some values that deviate too much away from the norm. So if we look into this one, we have some variable been captured over the time, and then suddenly there's a hike or peak inside the data. So this may indicate that you have anomaly, some problem happened. Okay, this problem can have a reason. For example, if you are looking for the share price uh, in the last decade, for example, in 2008, where there were uh, e-commerce global issue. So you will see that suddenly there were drop in the share price, right? Because there was an incident happened during that time. But anyway, that one was an outlier. Not every day you have financial crisis, I mean, over the globe. So this is something can be marked as outlier. Now the patterns or the characteristic of time series, there are few. We have trend, seasonality, autocorrelation, noise, and non-stationary time series. So let's go again, look. So trend simply where we have underlying pattern of growth, right, or drop in the value over the time. So as if you look to this figure, let's say, assume that this is the uh, x-axis is the time recorded, and on the y-axis, you have the total sales of product. So what we can observe as the time increases, by the time, the number of sales also increases going up. So that means there is a trend inside, or there is a trend of sales where you have upward or increment or growth of the sales over the time. So this is, we call it a trend. Trend can be upward, can be downward. Okay. So you can think of it. Imagine like the general upward slope you'd see on a graph of your height from childhood to adulthood. If you are recording your height, that means there's a growth, right? So there's a trend, which is that your growth or your height is being uh, incremented or increased over the time. Now, can be, as I said, upward, can be downward. When, again, I repeat the question, when we may have no trend. No trend when the value is fixed over the time. Let's say if you are capturing, like we took an example, the oil price of the type 95. So looking back one year, probably more, until today, the price hasn't changed, right? All the time, one liter is for two ringgit, five cents. So if you draw a figure, capturing the values or the changes of the price over the time is going to be horizontal line, indicating there is no trend inside the data set. The other characteristic is seasonality. Seasonality refers to a repetitive pattern over the time, or I like also this saying predictable fluctuation over the time. That means there is a fluctuation going up and down in the data, but it's predictable because it is repetitive, same pattern, is getting repeated over and over the time, again and again. So this is, we call it seasonality. So you need to look into your figure when you spot or when you look during data exploration, data understanding, then you can see whether you have seasonality and, and or not. And what is the period for seasonality? Is seasonality is getting repeated every three months, every six months, every one year, right? So you need to spot that inside your data set. Why? Because later you're going to see when we split our data into training and validation or test set, we need to have complete seasonal cycles inside our data set or inside our training or validation or even test set. So the figure can have trend and seasonality, both, right? So if you look into this figure, you have seasonality, repetitive pattern. The same pattern is being repeated over the time, but as long as well, there is a slope upward slope going up. So we can say that there's a trend as well as seasonality inside this sample. 
of data set. Autocorrelation is another characteristic you can describe time series where the data point at one time is related to the data point of preceding or succeeding value. So we call it autocorrelation. So if you look into this example where you have a smooth line, right? So imagine like there's a dot, but all these dots like going related to each other. If you have slope going down, so the price every day, let's say, go down, right? And then if you if you connect these dots, you're gonna get like this smooth line. Or if you like to take simple analogy looking into it, like if you slept for the last few days well, so you can expect to sleep today well as well, meaning the habit or what you're going to experience today when the time of sleep comes is related to your previous days. So there's autocorrelation between the value and its proceeding, right? It's your habit for the last few days. So we can say there is autocorrelation, but again, autocorrelation you may not spot it easily like this right so in real life you will have some noise term inside your data so actually these two figures are the same same data exactly same data except this figure we took away the noise so we got smooth line while this figure we added the noise so we got the figure like this but the point is still saying that we have autocorrelation Right, so same like if you are looking for the share price between today and tomorrow. So you would expect tomorrow is going to be something similar to today with either some variant of increment or decrement in the value, right? So it is again connected to its preceding value. We call it autocorrelation. Now the noise is random variation inside the data set and it doesn't contain any useful information. Noise can exist in any data set, not only in time series. Any data set you work on, even for regression case, for classification, you may have noises inside your data set. So that's common in all data sets, not only in time series. Now, your, when you work on time prediction, let's say this is the blue line we're showing you the previous values, and then you are, you are interested to forecast look for the future, what the values are going to be in the future, taking into account the trend and seasonality, right? Taking them into consideration as well. Now, what do we mean by stationary and non-stationary data set? Now, stationary or non-stationary, let's start with it, is a time series is said to be non-stationary if its statistical properties like mean and variance change over the time. So here, the definition is about non-stationary. Now, the data set that we worked on during the practical was stationary, right? So we are looking into stationary. So again, what is non-stationary? When you have, when your statistical properties like mean and variance change over the time. Take the example here. So this figure is one example of time series where the data is stationary. Still not clear, then we look to the example of non-stationary. If you look into these two figures, in specific. What you notice, you will notice that if you calculate the mean for the first part, right, because there's sudden change in the mean of set of values over the time. So if you take the first part and calculate the mean and take the second part and calculate the mean, you're going to see that there's a quite different mean between the first part and second part. So we call this data set is non-stationary. Probably a good example if you consider looking, if you are collecting data maybe before MCO and during MCO there might be something has happened, which can, can cause the data to become non-stationary data set. Okay? Or it can be shift in variance. So earlier you see like the variation for the values going up and down is smaller, and then suddenly there is quite big variance in the values, either going up or going down. So this again makes the data non-stationary data. Why we need to know this, whether it's stationary or non-stationary, because most time series model assume the data is stationary. So if you often, sorry, you often need to transform non-stationary data to make it stationary before you can effectively model it, before you can develop or train your model. Now we come to the following part, which is how to prepare our training, validation, and test set. 
Now, in order to do this, there are two ways. Either you can do the fixed partitioning that we're going to discuss now, or there is roll forward partitioning. OK, let's look into fixed partitioning. Fixed partitioning, meaning you decide in advance what where's the split time, like as we did during the practical session. So we put, for example, split time 1000 or 1095. So that is fixed. So from earlier time, we fixed and we decided which portion what is the time time split? And we decided to take the portion for the training data. And the other one is for validation and the other one for test set. Now, when you do splitting your data, it's very important to make sure that each phase encompasses a complete set of seasonal cycles. So in this example, we have four seasonal cycles. So you will see the same pattern being repeated over four times. So one, two, three, four. So we took the first two cycles to be our training data, one cycle, one complete cycle for validation and one complete cycle for test set. OK, so understood you need to have complete set of seasonal cycles for training, validation and test set. As we did during the practical session. Now, how to evaluate time series model? So time series model can be evaluated using the metrics like those metrics that we used earlier during regression time. So you have mean square error, root mean square error, and mean absolute error, for example. So you can apply them in order to measure or to evaluate your model, to see how your model is doing. Now, when you evaluate your model, for example, like taking MAE, sorry, I didn't fix this. This should be MAE. I forgot, so maybe you fix it on your side. The value here, the evaluation is by using MAE. Now, when you when you are measuring or evaluating your model, right? MAE refers to the error term, right? So the perfect case, the so perfect case where MAE is zero, or MSE is zero, or root mean square error is zero. But the value can go also up, right? Can go up, but now the question comes in, what is, let's say, the threshold that can determine this is the highest error that we should have, right? Because error term can, can be varied from zero to infinity, let's say. You can have a lot of errors. But the point is, what is our maximum error that we can tolerate? At least we are using it as a threshold or benchmark to know how to, when we evaluate our model, to know how good our model or not. So if you remember back in the practical session, practical six, right? We use dummy classifier. You remember dummy classifier? I feel some people are just here, but they're tired maybe. OK, so dummy classifier, we used it earlier. For what reason? Earlier we used it to prove that accuracy is not appropriate all the, all the time, right? Especially when we have imbalanced data set. When we have imbalanced data set, meaning we have a more data, bigger portion of data for one class over the other class. So that means we have imbalanced data set, then accuracy won't be very appropriate. But also you can use dummy classifier to set the minimum accuracy threshold that you should have. So back then we had accuracy was 90%. Right? That means without using any data mining, without applying any AI component, there is no artificial intelligence whatsoever, using just dummy classifier, which used to do what? Which actually just going to see which class got the higher portion, proportion inside the data set, and assume all the data points belong to that class. That's the only thing. There's no AI whatsoever. So the dummy classifier given us 90%. That means whatever model next you're going to do, right, should give you accuracy higher than 90%. Otherwise, your model is doing more dummier than the dummy classifier itself, right? So we can use it to see how good our model, like there's a minimum threshold we should expect, or like an accuracy, the minimum accuracy we should expect from our AI models. Now, same in time series, we need to do something similar. So we have naive forecasting, or if you like to call it dummy forecasting. Naive forecasting assume 
that the current value for whatever readings, whatever, whatever time series data set you have, is the current value is same as the previous value. Okay? So here what it says, we take the last value and then we assume it's going to be the next value, same one. Now, if you do this, you're going to get, again, this is MAE, please fix it, I forgot. So you're going to get some figure. Now, this figure, you can use it as a threshold to know that, okay, whatever subsequent model you are going to build, whatever subsequent model you are going to build must be, have mean absolute error lower than this value, okay? Okay, now we move to one of the very simple approach in order to do forecasting for time series, which is called moving average approach. This technique, simply what is it? The moving average approach is straightforward or simple forecasting method, which simply depends on taking values over a specific time frame and then calculate the average, take the average. For example, let's say we need to forecast what is the oil price for tomorrow. Then by deciding to have a time frame, let's say of 30 days, then we go and collect the data for the last 30 days for the oil price. And then we take the mean value for the 30, the previous 30 readings. And then we assume that tomorrow is gonna be the average or the mean value for these data points. Okay, this is in short, what is moving average approach. Now, moving average approach, what it does, if you look into this figure, it has given us the original data is in the blue. The moving average uh, line is in orange. So actually, if you notice, it has eliminated a lot of the noise inside the data. So we got a smooth line, right? But the problem in moving average, the problem in moving average cannot anticipate trend and seasonality. So it cannot work on the data which has trend and seasonality very well. And that obvious, if you calculate the MAE, is gonna be higher than the naive forecasting MAE, right? So that means it's not working very well. So what we need to do in this case, to keep going with moving average, we need to apply the technique called differencing, which helps us to remove the trend and seasonality from the data set. Then we apply back moving average. Okay, so here we can apply differencing again to remove the trend and seasonality. If you apply it on our previous data set, you're going to get this data. Now, looking into this figure, do you, can you spot any trend? No more trend. There's no upward, no downward. There's just like flat. If you draw a line to represent this data, it's going to be a flat line or horizontal line, meaning we have no trend. And of course, no seasonality. We cannot spot repetitive pattern or predictable fluctuation over the time. There is no repetitive pattern we can spot inside the data. Now, how to apply differencing? Simply, you take, you take the values at some time, and then you subtract it from the corresponding value at some earlier time. But how to decide which is the corresponding value of earlier time that we need to subtract you can look back to seasonality. Since we have seasonality in our case, this is why, and seasonality in the previous figure was for 365 days. That means for one year. Then we subtract the values, the current values from their corresponding value of the last year. So again, think of it like if I have data set for, let's say the gold price for 2022 and 2021, then I subtract the values of gold of 2022 from or by the values of 2021. Okay, that means I check the price, the gold price on 1st of January 2022 minus the price of on the 1st of January in 2021, and so on and so forth. This is going to give me a figure like this where I have no trend and seasonality. Then I apply moving average again on this difference. Again, notice on the difference time series. So please, you can highlight. This is we are applying on the difference time series. Again, we got this line with uh, where we uh, eliminate the noise. So we got the moving average. 
Now, how to get back the original value? Because this is moving average applied on the difference time series, not on the original time series. So simply we go and take back the original value that we subtracted and we add it back to the figure. Then it's going to give us this model, which is quite, it looks much better than the earlier one. So if you compare this one, right, with the other one, this one look more resembling the original figure. But there is a problem that we have. You see the figure or the line, the orange line is no more smooth as before. Why? Because we captured or we pick up the noise from the original data when we add it back. When we add it back, the original data from the blue line to the orange line, we picked as well the noise from the original data. But anyway, even we still have a noise, we got MAE slightly better than the naive forecasting in this example. But again, still not good because we got the noise added back from the original data. In order to come to the last figure or the last solution is instead of taking the original or the past value, we take the smooth past value. So how to get smooth past value, meaning to try to reduce the noise by also applying moving average on the past value before we add it back to to what to the moving average of the difference time series and this is will yield us this figure which is quite better than this one so if you check this one we got here mae 5.8 while in this one mae has dropped down to 4.5 okay any question Let's see. Okay, no question. If you have a question, you can type a question here. Again, this is the one of the simple and statistical approach you can apply, okay? Again, data mining depends on statistic as well, by the way, if you don't know, like regression. Regression is a statistical method. It's not invented when AI comes in. Regression was exist or existed long time ago, right? But we found it is very useful to do prediction. So we applied statistical approach like regression. This is also one of the statistical approach to do time forecasting. If you like to do using deep learning, then you can read on your own. Okay, we're not gonna cover it in this course. But you have the concept of deep learning or neural network, then just you can expand on your own. Go read and see how you can apply time series using deep learning. 